I mean, it's great to be back with you this morning. Uh, boy, this is a great spirit in the church today. Just a great spirit of worship, a great spirit of, spirit of celebration. I uh, love that song. We just have joy that's contagious. Absolute joy that's contagious. Uh, let me, we're going to look here at uh, Philippians, continue in our, our series, walking through the, the book of Philippians together and seeing all the things uh, the Lord has for us and the joy the Lord has for us. Um, there's a couple of things as you're turning there, I just want to draw your attention to and, and just say about here, uh, we, as we look here in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 19 through 30 is our focus. Um, first of all, uh, Watched the news this morning, didn't catch it all yesterday, and just devastated by the, what's coming out of El Paso and coming out of Dayton. It was kind of humbling to see, turn on the, the news, and if you haven't watched it, I, I, there's been some mass shootings both in both of those cities uh, within like a 24-hour period of each other. And so, a um, couple of things. Uh, one, it was just kind of shocking. We were actually in Dayton about a week ago, week and a half ago. And so just to hear that, that connection was kind of nervous. But fortunately, we weren't out at one in the morning and down in the areas where the, the shooting was. We were in a hotel that, that had a lot better reviews online than I would have given it from being there. Um, but <laughs> it, was a, it was a little, yeah. Um, but just our heart goes out. Uh, to families. Our heart goes out to, to friends who have just gone through that and just trying to wrestle with that as a culture. What does that mean? Why is this happening? But I could not help thinking, and this is why I want to draw, a couple of reasons why I want to draw attention to it. One, to pray. And two, that the gospel is rich and the news is good uh, for those who believe. And that song we just sang, Death is Arrested. Death is Arrested. You know, when we talk about death and life in our culture, and we are just in a culture where we see that often, death is arrested. Death no longer has effect on the believers. We need to rejoice in that and be diligent in sharing that with others who are wrestling with. And so I hope this next week, as these conversation points come up with people that you're talking to about these events and, and other events that have happened in our life, I hope by God's grace that he's able to, to use you to turn the conversation to say, you know, as a believer, as a follower in Jesus, I have the hope that death has been arrested. It is no more. And there is no more fear uh, when death comes, whenever the Lord happens to bring that. And so our prayers want to go out uh, to those who are involved in this and in both of these events, but our hearts also want to be tuned to how, the, how God might use this in our lives, in our everyday conversation to share the hope that never fades. And so I, I just want to draw the attention to that. Secondly, before we turn to our text, I want to just, just again, reaffirm the, the India mission trip that Denise had come back and shared just briefly about next Sunday. I just think to, to reaffirm that with you all, next Sunday, right after service, we'll have a little pizza, a little lunch, and she's going to share in depth as to, to the details of this trip and all the things that God had done, both getting them there and work through that team while they're in that city, in that country of India, in that region of Malagao. An amazing place, a very dark uh, city, dark in the sense of spiritual darkness, just reigning in the forms of Islam and Hinduism uh, that are just throughout that, that particular nation. Uh, the world's eyes are starting to turn towards India even more in so, in so many different ways. So it's crucial that we're engaged in missions for this country. Lord willing, through our partnership with the Lynn Livingston Association, we will be able to take another team in right after, sometime after the first of the year. Those dates have not been set yet. But if through what has been said this morning, what has been said in previous weeks, what will be said in coming weeks as we gather as a church to pray for this region, that God will break up the spiritual soil in that area. Uh, he may be plugging on your heart, putting on your heart, hey, I need to be a part of this. I need to be in this region. I, I need to see what God is doing here and how he might use me in this very, very unique place. And so be in prayer for that and plan to attend the lunch next Sunday afternoon to hear more about what's happening there in India. Philippians chapter 2. It's so good to be back with you. Uh, I'm thankful for Travis and for Steve from the Baptist Home to share uh, last week. I understand Steve did a poem. I like reading poems. Not much of a poet, but uh, we we'll just kind of leave it at that. I appreciate Steve and his. Steve's been a great friend for a long time, uh, and, and um, if you, I can tell you later how we met, and it's a great story. Um, but Steve and I have been friends for a long time, and and still like each other. So that's even better. 
Uh, so, but I really appreciate him sharing that last week. Uh, we're glad to be on vacation times just to rest and reflect and think about where we're at, where what the Lord is doing, where he's leading us to, and just to connect uninterrupted. Um, I will just recommend, we went to Cincinnati area uh, for vacation, spent time in the Creation Museum and the Ark Experience, and I would highly encourage that. If the Lord affords you an opportunity to do that, I would highly recommend it. It will not only uh, strengthen Strengthen your faith and encourage your faith, those two exhibits, but they're produced in such a way that they examine from a scientific perspective how a creation came about, how uh, the flood came about, and I would highly, highly encourage uh, attending that. We also attended a Reds game, our team won, yay, go our team, and, uh, but <laughs> we had a great, great time, but it's good to be home, it's real good to be home. Philippians chapter two, beginning in verse 19. In, in this section, really, I think we kind of build this, these verses here uh, serve a, as both a, a closing and the beginning of a new section. And as we breaking, as I'm breaking Philippians down into chunks, uh, we really start looking at here in this letter, the priorities of the kingdom of heaven. And the title of your message here it has talked about loving each other well and caring for each other well. And in these verses, uh, Paul highlights two men, uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus, who are serving him and serving the church and, and just loving each other well. All of these come from really this, the, the theme of chapter 1, verse 27, that says this, live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life that is full of honor and glory and worth to Jesus Christ. And so these sections here, these verses both kind of close that, what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, but also then begin a section on living out priorities of the kingdom of God. And what does it actually look like for you and I as modern men and women to live out priorities of the kingdom of God with each other? I look here as we notice here how important these relationships are, and we'll read through these verses and have a word of prayer together. Uh, Paul writes this, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by good news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Let me just pause there a second. When he says they, and anytime there's a they, you know, they did this, they're doing that, they over here doing that. The they here of these verses are those who are sharing the false gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing that, that, that faith comes with works or faith has to be earned or you've lost your faith. And so he's saying, look, there are, there are a group of people who are trying trying to influence you, Philippian church, uh, who do not have your interest nor the interest of Jesus at heart. Timothy is not like those people. Timothy has both the interest of Jesus, living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he has your interest at heart. So he, he is not like them. Continue on to read there. But but you know, intimately aware of Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. And just kind of pause there. What is he talking about there? He's saying here, look, I, I'm in prison now in the city of Philippi. And that's the city of Philippi. I'm in prison in Rome. We're assuming that he's in Rome now. And he's writing back to this church. No one else is with me. Only Timothy is with me. He has served alongside with me and not under me. Uh, he is not my, my fledgling. He's not my gopher boy. He's not going to pick up the coffee and the dry cleaning. He has served along with me me in the gospel. And he is the only one that is with me now. But in the Lord Jesus, I hope to send him to you soon as he's received a letter from this church and, 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 and support from this church in the city of Philippi. He says, look, I'm hoping to send him to you to encourage you because he is a tremendous encouragement to me. And then I, not only that, uh, but I'm going to do that as soon as I figure out, as soon as it's revealed, what's going to happen to me. What does he mean there? He means that, that this, as soon as I know if I'm going to live or I'm going to die, then I'm sending Timothy to you. 
So in other words, as soon as I have real and accurate, legitimate information, not rumors, not speculation, I'm going to send Timothy with you to let you know this is what's going to happen to me. But then he even holds out here the end. says, but I hope to join you soon. I hope to be there as well. And so there's a strong possibility here that, that Paul may be going home. I don't think that happened in this case. I think it happened at a later time. But he's saying, look, there's a strong chance that, that this is it. But I don't think that's the case. Either way, I'm sending Timothy to you, and I hope to be there soon. But notice here that they have also, he's also not, he's also received Epaphroditus. So he's not completely alone. He has another man with him. Look at uh, verse 25. It says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. In other words here, verse 25 tells us that, look, Epaphroditus has come to Rome. You have sent him here with a message. You have sent him here with a gift to help support me. We see that towards the end of the, cha- end of the book. And I am so thankful. And I want you to know that he is on equal terms here with us. He is a fellow worker, a fellow soldier. He is from you. He is your messenger, your minister. And we're just thrilled that he is here. But look, listen on in verse 26. For he has been longing for you all. And he's been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Just feel just the passion here that they have for each other. Unless I have sorrow upon sorrow, if, if he had died on his way here, then I would just been overcome with grief. And I know you're worried about him because you've heard that he was sick. And, and look, look here as he goes on. It says, uh, he, he received, uh, he, he was near to the point of death. In verse 28, I am more eager to send him Remember, he's just there he, with Timothy and Epaphroditus. Therefore, that you may rejoice in seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. Why would he be anxious? He's anxious because they're worried about him. They're worried about him. We, we love this guy. We love this man that we've sent to you. He, he is the best of us. We've sent him from our church to minister to you, to represent us within the church and, and to share and meet your need. But you've heard he's sick, near to the point of death. I'm anxious, you're anxious about him. Receive him in the Lord. As I send him back, receive him in the Lord with all joy and, key here, honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray together here. Father, we, we just come to you as we've walked through these verses together and sharing some things about this, getting a sense of what's happening here within this letter, within this section, as we live ourselves, striving to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, living out these priorities of the kingdom. Well, what is it that you have for us this morning from these verses, real life, real time, real men, real places that you worked in and through? Lord, help us to see this text even more today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's there's a lot within these verses. But but one thing jumps out here, and kind of a theme as we look at some some traits that come from these verses. The one thing that jumps out is, and it kind of affirms us all, that, that life is about relationships. Life is all about relationships. Here is Paul who has a relationship with this church, many churches, but specifically the church in the city of Philippi. He has a relationship with Timothy, his spiritual son. He has a relationship uh, with Epaphroditus who who has come from the church to care for his need. All of life is absolutely driven by relationships. Now, if you pause for a moment and begin to think about all the relationships over your course of life, and you begin to think about some of the, the worst relationship you have ever had, you can probably think, think of some key words that would describe those feelings. And remember, we're in church. We want to keep those words to ourselves. You know, you think about how those things are. And so we know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a bad relationship. At the same time, hopefully, prayerfully, God's grace on your life, you know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a great relationship. 
and what that looks like. And here's the, but here's the thing about relationships. When you are in a relationship with someone else, you can do nothing to control what they do. Now that may be news to some of us this morning, but you can do nothing to control what they do and how they respond in that relationship. The only thing that you can do is try to influence that relationship by your character and your traits, by seeking the Lord yourself and living those things out. And what Paul is driving us to, and what this text here is driving us toward, highlighting these relationships. And I want to highlight some traits, some characteristics of these men that we can embrace and receive and act on to become the men and women living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the priorities of the kingdom. There's 10 different traits I've identified. We probably won't get to them all. I just want to look at, at a few of them here about these about these, these texts. First of all, I want you to notice here um, on the, a couple observations as to why that these, are, they, these are things that we can embrace. Did you notice this phrase in, in ha- about halfway through, but three quarters of the way through in, in verse 29 that says this, so receive him, Epaphroditus, in the Lord and honor such men. Honor such men. Now, if that's an interesting phrase, that phrase just kind of leaps off the pages because it begins with the verse in a very singular fashion, addressing one person, receive Epaphroditus well, and honor such men. Honor people like him. Give honor and respect and admiration to men and women who are demonstrating traits and qualities like him. And I think we can even include Timothy in that because he's planning on sending Timothy as well. You and I have people in our lives that have that are influenced us and, and, and we want to not we want to not only give them honor, but we also even find ourselves kind of acting like them, emulating them, taking on their traits and their characteristics. I mean, you know the old story of, of the, the lady who was fixing the roast and chopped the end of the roast off to put it into a pan and their daughter asked, well, why do you keep doing that? Well, mom did that. Well, why does mom do that? Well, grandma did that. Go to grandma. Why did grandma do that? Because that was the size of the pan that she had. And we, we know the story. We've heard that a thousand times. But what's the, the driving of that, that great little story? Influence. You're looking to someone. This is how they're living. And because they're living this way and you have great honor and admiration for them, you're gonna live that way as well. And this is what here. Well, what does this look like? Look at these traits here. And Enrico's got these on the screen and we'll try to keep them in the order that I gave them to him. <laughs> so we'll do, our be- do my best. First of all, I want you to notice that they're people. Now that's, that's, not, a, that's not a huge observation. They're people. Well, of course they're people. But here's the thing we need to remember about people is that people are used by God. They were people who matter. They were people who were created to matter, to make an impact. You and I have been created to matter and make a difference for the kingdom of God. I've been reading a book lately by Eugene Peterson called as King King Fisher's Catch Fire. And he writes this. He says, God makes persons God remakes persons, a person like you, a person like me. It is not through nations and armies, not through movements and ideas, not through laboratories and machines and computers that God does his primary work. It is through persons. These are people who God is using. You are a person that God can use in an extraordinary way. These men here, these three, Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, are not, they are tremendous, they're wonderful, amazing people, but they're people. They, as as the phrase says, put their pants on one leg at a time. This past week, I had the privilege of serving as a camp counselor with our association's children's camp. I had third and fourth grade boys, all third grade, one fourth grade, so eight and nine-year-old boys. By Tuesday night, it was homesick haven in our cabin. They were ready to go home. It's like, okay, let's just make it through the night. We'll make it through the night. They made it through the night, and, and they, all, they all stuck around. It, it, we had a great, great week. So, or Monday afternoon, when they start showing up and they start figuring out their names and where they're from, what their family's like, I had a couple of guys come up to me and start telling me all the things that they can do, 
all the things that their parents have done, all the things that are amazing in their family. You know, you know I, my family has done this. I can do this. I can do this. And, and they're kind of all jockeying for a position in there. Why? Because they want to matter. This little guy is telling me how important his family is. Why? Because he wants to be seen. He wants to know he's important. We're the exact same way. We want to be seen. We want to know we're important. We want to know we matter. And what the gospel tells us, because of Jesus Christ and his work in us to give us salvation and his work through us to demonstrate that salvation, you matter and you're made to make a difference. These three men matter because they're people. These three men also matter and traits of them is that, that they're dependent Notice here, there are three times in, in which they, they, the phrase we see in the Lord comes up in these 11 verses. So when I say here that they're dependent, they are dependent upon the Lord. Paul writes in verse 19, says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy. In verse 24, I trust in the Lord that I, shortly I will, myself will come. In verse 29, it says, receive him in the Lord. And here's the thing about all of these phrases in the Lord, they're all future oriented. They're all directed towards the future. In the Lord, I hope to come to you soon. In the Lord, I hope to see Timothy. In the Lord, I hope to, that you will receive him when he returns to you. All these things happen in the Lord. What are they doing here? They're depending on the Lord for every step of life. They're making plans. Paul is saying, here, look, I'm hoping to get out of here. My plan is to get out of here. My desire is to come back and see you. That might not happen. My plan is this, if the Lord wills it. James reminds us of that. You, you don't go to a city and say, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You don't know what your day is like. What you do is say, we're going to do this if the Lord wills it because they're dependent upon the Lord. The traits of men and women who have, are worthy of the gospel of Christ, who are king, live out kingdom different priorities are men and women who are dependent on the Lord in everything. So when you're planning your life, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this this next week. Hey, this time next year, we're going to go and do this. Wouldn't it be great if we went and did that trip? Wouldn't it be great if we you know, got that house? Wouldn't it be great if we did all these things in the Lord. If God wants us to have these things, we're going to be moving, we're going to be planning, we're going to be pressing toward those, those things, but we're going to trust that he's always leading us. And when if things don't go, go like we have planned, we're going to trust that because we come in the Lord, dependent upon him, that he's working these things out. It's like the old, old country th song. I think it's Garth Brooks. I, I thank God for unanswered prayers. This is my plan. God had something different. Sometimes here, I think what we do is we've taken God's will for our lives and we've made it so much more complicated than what the Bible tells us it needs to be. We want the flashing sign. We want the audible voice. But what God is telling us here is honor me with every part of your life. Make decisions. And if it is my will, those things will happen. They're dependent upon the Lord. Men and women are absolutely dependent upon the Lord. Notice here also uh, another trait that, uh, that we see of these particular people is that they are dependable people. People depended upon them. Hey, Epaphroditus, we're going to send you. I can just imagine how this, this church meeting went down. We're going to collect up an offering for our brother Paul. He's sitting in a prison. He's got nobody else there but Timothy. And Timothy doesn't cook very well. So we need to make sure we send him money so that he can eat and, and be fed and, and be clothed and, be, and just be well because he's in prison at his own expense. Well, who in our lives are we going to trust enough to travel these hundreds of miles off in, in wilderness, crossing mountains, crossing uh, uh, bandit-driven roads, all these things. Who are we going to trust to actually get there no matter what? Epaphroditus. Because he's dependable. When, when we think about what it is to be used and living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, making a difference, allowing and seeing God make a difference in our lives, we must be dependable people. That means that people can turn to you and say, yes, I can trust in them. Their yes is yes and their no is no. I can yield into them. I can trust in them. And the church of Philippi depended upon them and it even almost cost him his life. Somewhere he got ill. 
but he completed his mission because he's dependable. A few years ago, we had an opportunity to go on vacation, and vacations are awesome, love them, um, but we went zip lining, which to my wife's uh, praise terrified her. And, but she did it, and we were so thrilled. And, 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 and I don't want to embarrass you, but you were awesome at it. One of the things that we did was called this Superman. And what, this, what these things did is that they, they, they laid you on this mat, suspended in the air, and wrapped you in, in what I can only describe as a tarp, but really a thick tarp, and then kind of tightened you down so you didn't fall out, and then told you to keep your arms to your side because there's tree branches and, and we don't want you to you know, lose your arms. And so this, they sent this thing flying at 75 miles an hour over treetops, hundreds of feet in the air, wrapped up in this little, like a little burrito in this, this thing. All right. Now, you know what we had to do? We had to trust that the people who were putting, me, putting us on that thing were dependable enough to actually do it. They had already demonstrated that, but we continued to trust them because they had shown themselves dependable and trustworthy. And that's what it is to be men and women who are seeking after, the, after the God's kingdom. Men and women who are living worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ are dependable. We can trust in them. One more trait here and then, and then we'll, we'll close. I had 10, we're only gonna get to four, but the fourth one really quick. They were sacrificial. They were sacrificial. Paul was in prison and he was willing to send his spiritual son, Timothy, his fellow servant, fellow worker away. Epaphroditus had come and seen them, bringing them a great gift, a great message, fellow brother, fellow worker, fellow server, their minister and message deliverer. He was willing to send them away. He was going to be alone in prison. He was willing to sacrifice his temporary comfort for the betterment of the church in Philippi. Often, the Lord will call us to sacrifice ourselves, our comfort, our ease, uh, to push, put us in a position where we're completely and totally uncomfortable and dependent on him as we serve him. Sometimes serving the Lord is, is just an avenue and an overwhelming of blessing. But often that blessing doesn't happen without sacrifice. Jesus tells us here in Luke 9, verse 24, he says, for whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, if you spend all of your days, all of your energy trying to find yourself, you're going to miss it. But if you spend all of your days sacrificing and serving the Lord, serving Christ, losing your life for the sake of Jesus, you will find that thing you're looking for. Let me encourage you this morning. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Maybe God is putting you in a position where you are completely and totally uncomfortable and you need to sacrifice that in order to be where he's at work. Be dependable. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let people know that, hey, because the, I'm living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm living out priorities of the kingdom, the people who I am in a relationship with in my church, in my work, in my neighborhood, in my family, they can depend on me, not because I'm good, but because Jesus is great. We also have these, these other two here. I want you to, to be, be dependent on the Lord. Everything you do, in the Lord, we're going to do this and last. And this is going to be really hard. Be human. Be a person. But not just, not just someone who's breathing. Someone whom God is using. Someone who's loving the Lord every day, more and more every day, grounded in his word and being a man, being a woman in which God is going to use in extraordinary ways because you're an ordinary person that says, in the Lord, I'm going to serve him. I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna serve. 
I believe it was Mark Twain who said that there, there are men who, turn, who, men, who, uh, men who die in their 30s, they just don't know it yet. In, uh, in other words, there are a lot of men who die early on in their lives, but they continue on living for a long time. Bl- brothers, sisters, let's live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here, here's, here's kind of the, the, the good news, bad, bad news, worse news, good news, and great news. The bad news is this, that you and I can't live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ unless Jesus is within us because we're sinners. We are sons, of daughter, sons and daughters of Adam. And because Adam's rejection of God and Eve's rejection of God, sin entered into the world, and that's the bad news. We are completely and totally separated from God. The worst news is this, there's nothing we can do about it. No matter how hard we try to fix the brokenness in our lives, no matter how hard we try to repair the relationships on our own strength, we can't because of sin within our lives. But here's the great news, the good news. God took steps towards us. He initiated what we broke to restore us to himself through Jesus Christ who came and died for us, became a sacrifice for us so that all who look to him, call upon him as Lord, believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead, will receive the promise of Romans 10 and be saved. That is the good news. And here's the great news. He's coming again. He is coming again. And if he comes, if you transition, go through the revolving door of life from this side of life into eternity, or he comes first, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And God will ask, what have you done with my son? Have you trusted in the good news that I gave that there's hope, there's restoration? Today, maybe God has led you here so that you would trust in him for salvation. That you recognize that all the things in your life, relationships, you've tried everything and it's just falling apart. That's the worst bad news. The good news is God acted to fix it. Will you trust in him today? Will you trust in Christ today? Maybe you're here this morning and, and as a believer in Jesus, someone who's yielded your life to Jesus, you, you can say, hey, look, you know, if I really had to evaluate my relationships right now, they're just kind of, they're, they're not bad, but they're not great. They're certainly not what God wants. Would you yield to him today? Confess to him where you've wronged another, go to the other and say, I've wronged you. I, I want to make this better. Maybe you're here this morning and God's been leading you to be a part of this church family. And we would encourage you to come forward and down this aisle here and share, you know, I want to unite officially with this body of believers. Be in relation here as we encourage each other, uh, we challenge each other, but we walk together in the Lord. How is it the Lord's moving in your life today? Let's stand together and pray as Enrico comes and and lead us in worship this morning, singing in our invitation. Father, we, we come...